good morning to everybody. Isn't it a good day to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. All right, Cooper, come join me. All right. It's a great day for Cooper and his family. If you are here as an invited guest of Cooper, would you just wave at him right now? See all these people waving? <laughs> now, if you are a part of Cooper's church family, would you wave at him right now? There you go. See? It's all friends and family right here. What a great time we have to be together. Let's turn sideways. Grab a hold of me. All right. Cooper, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Based upon your public profession of Jesus Christ as your Savior, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What a testimony. What a way to begin a day. Now, we're getting ready to stand and worship, but I want, I'm going to pray for us. And then after we pray, I want to encourage you to take just a moment to look at the video screens, and then Zach will take it after that. So let me pray for us. Father, we come before you, and we thank you for your goodness to us. Father, we, as we studied in Sunday school this morning in the class I was in, Father, how you have granted it to us, Father, to be arrayed in the righteousness of Jesus. Father, I thank you for the testimony of Cooper this morning, Father. I thank you for him following you in believer's baptism. I thank you, Father, for his public identification of who his Lord is and who he serves. May it, Father, be a uh, testimony and an encouragement to each of us. And Father, if there are some in this room right now that do not yet know Jesus, may they be drawn to him today. And if there are others that haven't yet followed you in believers' baptism, Father, may they be encouraged today through Cooper's example. Father, you are worthy to be worshipped. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done. Thank you for your love. And we pray all of this in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Man, good morning. Welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here. We have much to celebrate this morning. Amen. <laughs> Let's stand as we sing together. This is redeemed by the blood of the Lamb.
when we can say we're redeemed by the blood. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship. This is our worship song of the month, and that's going to lead it. It's called Give Us Your Heart.
so much church for seeing you can be seated well good morning again it's still good to be in the house of the Lord amen amen what a great way to start off a service through baptism the Lord has so many things he wants for us to have as we seek him I'm so glad that you're here if you're with us on the phone we're glad that you're here if you're with us on YouTube or Facebook Live, we are glad that you are have joined us. And if you're here in the room with us, we are equally glad, if not especially glad, that you are here with us. And uh, we pray, I pray, that your focus, that my focus is on God this morning. I was reminded again as I was driving in, it's become this recurring theme that the Lord keeps battling me with, is that, Jeff, today... Somebody's going to be glorified in your life. It's either going to be you, Jeff, or it's going to be me. That's where we live every single day. And I'm glad that you're here. And I pray that it's the desire of your heart that God be honored and glorified in all that you do today. Hopefully when you came in, you received our call to action. And in there, I just want you to take time to read it all and react where we need to wanted to start with showing you children's ministry opportunities. That is a fancy church bulletin way of saying, we need you to sign up to do something. You guys got that, right? That's not unclear, right? That's good. We need you to, we need children's Sunday school teachers. We need nursery, child care workers. And you know, if you do the church, the, the child care, uh, you get all the juice and goldfish a person could want while you're back there. <laughs> and you only have to do it once every eight weeks. And you know what I think? Is if everybody who hasn't signed up to do it signs up to do it that will, you don't even have to do it once every eight weeks. You'll do it once every three months or more because we got a big family if we all took a turn. But I wanted to show you something else too. It's a short-term opportunity for you. Good News Club on Thursdays. You see that? Three weeks only the 14th of July, the 21st of July, and the 28th at the Kasperzik's home. Now, the Kasperzik's live in this really small subdivision on your way to Murfreesboro. There's the, got a light there. There's only like 400 homes over there. But after Bible school, Rachel came and she said, can we do something in my neighborhood? And I said, yes, we can. You plan it and we'll come. She's now inviting her neighborhood to come to a good news club in her, in, in her house, at her, at her house. And we, for three weeks in a row, we're going to go there and have good news club from 1030 to noon on those three days. What a great opportunity. One, for you to serve. Two, for us to be able to share the gospel with people that are Rachel's neighbors. So Rachel and Matt, thank you so much for doing that. And you too, if you live someplace that you want to have and host, you let Missy and I know. We'll figure out how to do good news clubs as often as we can in order to tell people about Jesus. Amen? Amen. So let us know that you want to be a part and will help us in many of these areas. Let us know that by contacting the church office. Contact Missy. Contact me. Or if you bump into Rachel and you want to help that, Rachel will then take that and let us know as well. Uh, it's a great day. Take time to look at that. Don't forget your memory verse on the back. I pray that you are keeping up every week with memorizing God's word, planting it deep in your heart. God has promised when you do that, it will change how you live for him. And uh, for that, I am thankful. All right, Children's Church, you can begin to make your way out. Miss Missy's back there. She is braced and ready for all the kids to come to Children's Church. They don't seem ready at all. Can you hear all the stomping? 
We talked about in Revelation chapter 19 in the young married class that I was, that I was in today about how the worship sounded like thunderings. And I was just reminded again when I heard all the pitter-patter of all those feet, how that is excitement. That's the rushing water of worship that they're going to go and worship God. So I'm just so thankful for that. Church, I'm going to ask you to stand, and then we're going to pray together. And then after we pray together, Zach's going to come and uh, lead us in just a little bit more worship. I am so thrilled that you are here. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, and we thank you for your goodness to us. Father, I'm just struck by your word today, how you have, Father, have granted it to us to be arrayed in the righteousness of Jesus. Father, we can't earn it. We can't deserve it. Father, we need it. And we thank you for loving us and giving us that opportunity that through faith we could come and know Jesus as our Savior. Father, I pray that is the testimony of all that are hearing this, watching this, or in this room. But Father, we pray that you would lead us from where we are to where you want us to be, regardless of where we stand with you. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to know you, to worship you, to get to know you better through your word. And Father, we just pray now that you'll be honored and glorified in all that we do. Father, I thank you for uh, your message ahead. Father, we thank you for uh, our opportunity in that message to recognize the freedom that you've given us as a country. But Father, I pray that you'll help us to recognize even more the freedom that you have given us the opportunity to have through Jesus eternally. And for that, Father, may we be most thankful. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you most of all for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. We sing with us, this is I Got Saved. Here we go. There is a river of gladness Pours from Emmanuel's veins The sinner was plunged Beneath the flood and God saved Since then I walk in forgiveness
Amen. We have all we can ever want or ever need. Amen. Thank you, church. You can be seated. God bless you. All right, it's holiday weekend. Tomorrow we uh, celebrate the 4th of July, a day that represents freedom that we've obtained as a country 246 years ago. And I remember the bicentennial, that would be 200 years of uh, being a country. And I was doing the math and I had to double check it. I'm going, man, I've gotten a lot older since this country was just 200 years old, 246 years ago. If you would take your Bible, turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It's not the only place we're going to go today, but we're going to start right there. If you're using that Pew Bible, it's on page 1,340. Now, I mentioned to you that tomorrow is the 4th of July. It's a day that we set aside as a country to remember the freedom that we have obtained as a country, the Declaration of Independence. I spent quite a bit of time this week reading it, studying it, understanding the history uh, around it. It is the original charter of our freedom. It was drafted, the final draft was on July the 2nd, 1776. It was adopted on July the 4th, 1776, and signed by, not all on that day, but signed by 56 leaders of our country at that time. It was first publicly read in Philadelphia on July the 8th, 1776, and it's, that means the Declaration of Independence, its reverberations have yet to cease in this country and around the world. Do you know I read about this, and this is off the notes, but I read about the Declaration of Independence of the United States and how it prompted other Groups of people throughout history to begin to think we can be free as well. I think that's really cool. The Declaration of Independence begins with an introduction. Let me just read that introduction to you. It says, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Now, it's followed by a preamble, and you're going, Jeff, history was not my thing. Well, some of you, history was your thing, but it's a great thing just to recover here, but followed by a preamble, Many of things that you've heard in this, I want to read this preamble as the context of how we're going to move off of this into Scripture today. But the preamble of the Declaration of Independence says this, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their Creator 
with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes and catch this church. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms of which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute depotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Now, when you continue to read the Declaration of Independence, there's a section called the indictment, a section called the failed warnings, a section called the denunciation, and then there's a conclusion, and then below that are the then 56 signatures of the people who wrote this. Now, I was drawn when I was reading that this week as I was looking at and cherish the freedom that we have as a country. I was drawn in there to this statement. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So I looked that up to make sure that I understood that. Unalienable rights means is defined as the rights that we, that are unable to be taken away or unable to be given away by the possessor. Those are rights that are granted by God, it says, our creator. So this holiday, this 4th of July, represents yet another opportunity for us to be thankful for our freedom and for the rights that we have as a country. But I was challenged as I read Scripture. And I believe that the only freedom greater than the freedom we have as citizens of the United States of America is the freedom that we can have through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And as citizens of heaven... God has given us unalienable rights through Jesus. So since I'm just going to read one verse, we're going to stay seated right here. But look with me in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Did you know that God's word has a lot to say about freedom? Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 says this. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. So let's talk about that verse as we launch into other scriptures for just a second. It says to stand fast. You know what that means? It means be firm, hold on to, do not let go. To what? The liberty. Well, liberty defined is a right or a privilege, a state of not being enslaved, being free from oppressive restrictions by authority. And yes, liberty can be defined and is defined as doing as one pleases. This liberty, we're told in verse 1, by which Christ made us free. So this is a very specific liberty God's Word is talking about. And if you know Jesus today, and remember, salvation is not something. Last week I said this, and a couple of people have brought it back to me, and it stuck with me. I said we were talking about salvation last week. Let me just make this statement again. Salvation is not something we get to say we have. Salvation is something God knows he has given us through our faith expressed in his son, Jesus Christ. So we need to make sure in our challenge last week and again this week is we want to claim our freedom in Christ, but we just need to make sure does Christ know our faith as real and do we truly have that freedom that we've been given. If you know Jesus today as your Savior, you have rights, you have freedom, you have choices only possible because of what Jesus Christ did for you. And the church was quiet. This is not in my notes, but 
Are you guys out there? We just talked about the greatest freedom that we have ever been granted. If you know Jesus, you have rights, freedoms, and choices only possible by what Jesus did to you. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. So Scripture reminds us that the liberties we have, the freedoms we have as a child of God, are granted to us wholly, solely, only through Jesus Christ and his life lived, his life died, his life resurrected, and his life ascended. Amen, church? You stand free if you know Jesus. And sometimes we get more excited as a country to celebrate our 246-year-old freedom in a temporary world, may I remind you, than we do about our eternal freedom granted to us by Jesus. You want to see what worship is like? It just won't stop. Small group, you're going, Jeff, please don't talk about small groups again. Revelation 19, that shows what worship's all about. They recognize that what they were given was given to them by God. Only by God. And when they were given that, they were given everything, and they could not hold back their worship and their praise. Hallelujah. Chapter 19 of Revelation said it was like the roar of rushing waters and the thunderings. And we challenged ourselves as a young married class. Yes, they let me come in with them. That we needed to make thunder for Jesus in the lives that we live for him. Amen? So church, please get excited about the freedom, the liberty, and the eternity that you've been granted. Because in verse 1, it says that if you're not, look at what it goes on. It says, and do not be entangled again. You know, I read about the what liberty is. Liberty is being untangled. And now, in Galatians, Paul is saying, be careful that you do not get entangled again. Do you know that in order to be entangled again, there was a period of time, whether it was small or long, where you were free. And in order to be free, there was a time prior to that where you were entangled. And Paul says you were once lost and then you were found, but sometimes when we don't allow God to be that person in our lives that leads and guides and directs us, we can all of a sudden find ourselves getting caught up and getting entangled in stuff again. We know this to be true. Many people live their Christian lives today entangled again. Now, I want to go back. I underlined a couple of other things that I wanted statement. There was this one statement in the introduction that said, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and the nature's God entitled them. Do you know that God has desired for you to be free through Jesus? And it goes on to say that experience has shown, catch this church, experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferer than to right themselves by abolishing the forms of which they are accustomed. You know what that means? That we get used to the suffering, we think there's nothing we can do about it, and so we just settle in and accept it. That's what it says. That we would rather give in to the evil than to fight for the freedom. So it's possible today that while you know Jesus as your Savior, it's possible today, Scripture teaches, that you could be entangled Again, that you are not living free, and I believe that happens one of two ways. One is that you have not yet come to know Jesus as your Savior. You know this. You fight this. You're probably being convicted by this, but you know that you've never truly yielded your life by faith to Christ. So you cannot be untangled yet. Or you know Jesus, but you're not yet taking hold of the full freedoms and the liberties that he has granted unto you in Jesus. In either case, 
Galatians 5.1 says that you're entangled with a yoke of bondage. So before we take just a moment to talk about some scriptural freedoms that we have been afforded through Christ, God just laid on my heart, I wanted to remind us first of our need. So if you want to turn with me, you can turn with me to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you're using that pew Bible, it's on page 359, and you're going, Jeff, what do I do about Galatians 5.1? You can let it go. We're not going back there any longer. You now have a free finger to go to, uh, to 2 Samuel chapter 9. It's on page 359. Now, when we get to 2 Samuel chapter 9, and if you've grown up, you've heard a lot of these Bible stories, and it's amazing how a lot of people haven't. But 2, chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 9, we find this is the setting. King Saul and his son Jonathan have been killed in battle. It happens in 2 Samuel chapters 3 and 4. King Saul was Israel's first king, and King Saul had turned his back on God, and God had chosen to remove his spirit from Saul and to place his spirit with David, and David was going to be the king. And there were uh, many years where Saul's jealousy as king, because he knew David was coming, that for 13 years, David did not ascend to the kingship, and Saul kept trying to kill him. Jonathan was Saul's son, but Scripture shows us was also David's best friend. And upon the death of the king, Saul, and his son, Jonathan, in battle. I know you're on chapter 9. I will read one verse from chapter 4. Here's what happened. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Now look at 2 Samuel chapter 9. We know this has happened. David takes the throne of Israel, and after some years, David inquires as to Saul's family. Now this would have not been unheard of. Every time a new ruler, whether it be biblically speaking or whether it be historically outside of biblically speaking, there seems to be this clearinghouse effect that happens where the new king goes and takes care of everybody that could be a challenge to the throne, and there's some life that tends to be lost and some security that they believe tends to be gained. So it wouldn't have been unheard of for David to inquire about anybody in Saul's family in order to take an action. So allow me to read in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. It says, Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left to the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And when he had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God. And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then king David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, here is your servant. And up to this point, you know, Mephibosheth probably think this is not going to go well. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Interesting. How quickly Mephibosheth's perspective in life went from, oh no, here's the end to, wow, what just happened? You see, prior to David in verse 7 saying that, his relationship, Mephibosheth's, was broken with the king. Mephibosheth, as we learn from the age of five on up, was unable to care for himself. Mephibosheth was entangled in the bondage that comes from being in hiding and slavery, and the king called for him. And the king offered him freedom and liberty. 
The king offered him all the possessions of his grandfather, and the king offered him a relationship daily with the king. The grace shown to Mephibosheth is a picture of the grace that God has desired to show us through Jesus. The relationship David desired with Mephibosheth was from a position of freedom and love. You see, David had the power to act as he chose. David had liberty. David could do as he pleased, and it pleased David to grant freedom to Mephibosheth to be in daily relationship with him. Likewise, church, Jesus came to us when we were in a broken relationship with him, when we were lame because of our sin, when we were unable to care for ourselves. And instead of giving us what most thought we deserved, which was death, he offered us life, freedom and liberty through Jesus Christ. Liberty is something Jesus offered to us. It is not something we are owed. What an offer. So if you know Jesus as your Savior, you have liberty. You are free. So I want us to look, and if you, on the back of your call to action, it's basically just lines for notes. And if you want to keep up with these scriptures, I'm going to point out to us just a few freedoms that Scripture says that we have so that we can make sure that we are living in liberty and freedom. Number one, Romans 8, 1 says you are free from condemnation. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus paid the price for your sin. And can I just remind you which sins Jesus has paid the price for? All of them. I don't care how bad you think they are. I don't care how long ago they are or how recent they are. The blood of Jesus was powerful enough that when you come to know him by faith, there is no more condemnation. Do you know the next person that will remind you of your sin of the past is you? Because we have not yet accepted that when Jesus does not no longer condemn us, we still sometimes like to condemn ourselves. But Scripture says when you come to know Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Jesus. Sometimes Christians can hold on to their sin, hold on to their guilt, their shame, But through Jesus, you have been set free. A beautiful picture when Jesus' forgiveness, the blood of Christ is applied to your life. When God looks at you, he looks at you through Jesus. That's the only way he can see you. And when he looks at you through the blood of Jesus, it's as if you've never sinned. How many of us are living in the freedom that Jesus wants us to have by understanding that there's now no more condemnation. Not only are you free from condemnation, Scripture teaches that you are free from death. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. No dying when you know Jesus, but have everlasting life. That life in Christ is everlasting But so many times we get the mistaken identity that 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 life is to come, that our eternal life is something that we will gain, which means that we do not yet have it. That's just not true. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. But yet sometimes we who claim Jesus as our Savior We don't have life. When Jesus says, you'll never have death, never. So you're free from condemnation. You're free from death. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 gives you another freedom. You are free to come boldly before God. That's pretty awesome. It says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace of help in time of need. God desires you to come into his presence. But yet many of us, because of the condemnation that we've not yet carried or set down, because of the death that we think we are still under until one day we get to go to heaven, we don't 
live that way. And so it separates us from God. And God says, no, I want you to come to me. And he doesn't say, just, just come on in with your head hanging low. You see what Scripture says? Come boldly. You know what that means? It's because of Jesus, you're in the right relationship with God. You can step right into God. Now, I'm not talking about being arrogant. Bold is because you know who you are through Jesus, and you know God's love for you, and so you feel comfortable coming before him. You are free to forgive others. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32 says this, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Do you know you are free? You do not have to hold grudges. You do not have to repay. You can simply forgive. You were given that freedom when you were forgiven. Hallelujah. Another freedom we have, you are free to overcome. Come. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. Do you know that a lot of Christians, we struggle because we're still living attached to our past? That when you came to know Jesus, your past is just that. It is past. It's gone. Never to be brought up again. We're not going to be condemned. Yes, we've covered that one, but we also have to recognize is that we've been made new, new opportunities, new heart, new life. What kind of, that's a great kind of freedom. You can start again. You can live the life that Christ desires for you. Next, you're free to love one another. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says, For you were called to freedom, so love one another. You can, through Jesus, actually learn to love people. All people. Yes, those people. Yeah, and him. Because the Spirit is contending with our hearts right now because we, we know these people. And we got them all listed over here. These are people I'm having a hard time loving. And Jesus says, yep, you can love that one, and you can love him, and you can love her, and you can love them. You can. I've given you the power to love people. Jesus said that is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You are free to love one another. I didn't write this down, but yet Scripture also says that you're free to love yourself. It is okay to have the appropriate view of how God sees you. And then allow that view to change how you see you. Amen? You're free to serve. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16 says, Live as people who are free, living as servants of God. In the call to action today, we say, man, we need people that are willing to serve in the areas of teaching our children. People that are willing to take a turn once every two to three months to serve child care. People that are willing to serve and go to a neighborhood good news club. Serve. And we're not just talking about things that you can sign up for that are at the church. You are free to serve in any way that you desire. God will lead you. He will guide you. He will grant you that opportunity and the ability. You are free to serve. Sometimes we do not take up as Christians one of the greatest joys God gives to us, and that is to serve him through serving others. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 says that you are free to share Jesus with people. Isaiah 61, 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring the good news to proclaim liberty to the captives. Do you know that people who do not know Jesus are captives? They're not entangled again. They've never been untangled to begin with. 
And we, those of us that are free by Jesus, we have the opportunity to share Jesus with them. How many times do we talk to people about the freedoms we have as Americans? How much more should we talk to people about the freedoms we have through Jesus and how those freedoms can be granted and extended to them, not through us, but through Jesus. We get to share about Jesus. That's pretty cool. And the cool thing about this country and that freedom of sharing Jesus is you do not yet get shot in this country for doing that. It's okay. Until such a time it becomes unokay, you are free to be free to share Jesus with people. Now, when it becomes a crime in this country to share Jesus with people, then we'll have a sermon on that day to pump us up to go and tell them about Jesus anyway. But right now, we don't need that because it's free for us to share about Jesus to people. That's pretty awesome. You know, you can be free from distress. If I ask you to raise your hand, how many of you are carrying a challenge, a problem, a distress right now, the room. There you go. There's one hand that went up and one even going out. I was going to say, don't raise them. <laughs> because what I know is going to happen is we're all going to have something. We all tend to carry something that distresses us. But you are free from distress. Psalm 118 verse 5 says, Out of my distress I called on the Lord, and he answered me and set me free. Whatever distress you're carrying, whatever challenge you're carrying, Jesus says, bring it to me, and I will set you free. Wow. But yet many times, Christians, we just hold on to it. And you just don't have to. You can be free. You can turn every situation over to Jesus. We don't have to carry it alone. We're, freed for, we're free to ask for wisdom. James 1, 5, we've been studying James on Wednesday nights, but it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God desires to provide you the wisdom you need to seek him, serve him, and to be used by him. All you have to do is ask for it. You're free. Will he give it to me? Yes. How do you know? I'm not real smart. But every time I find myself in a situation where I need to be used of God and I remember that I can ask for wisdom and he will give it to me, he does. Because if you've ever heard me say anything that sounded the least bit wise, it is not because I got lucky. It is because God is faithful. And then one more, and these are not it. I just stopped so I didn't scare you too much. But Romans 6, says that you are free to become like Jesus. Listen to this. But now having been set free from sin, free from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness. Scripture is teaching you this is a picture of a big Christian word called sanctification, that God can make you more and more day by day into the image of his son. You can be set free from sin. You can grow and mature. And yes, you can sin less. Now, I can get into arguments with people that say, but we're always going to sin this side of heaven, right? Right. But you don't have to. And if you will take up the freedoms that God desires to give you and has offered to you and know him and trust him and seek him and all these things, I guarantee you this, you will sin less because you will be more and more like Jesus. These freedoms are just the beginning of what God desires for you. So back to this phrase, un. Alienable rights. 
based on definition, you cannot lose these rights once you become a child of God. You cannot give these rights away once you become a child of God. These, because they're unalienable rights, they become yours permanently through Jesus. But... You can set them down. You can not claim them, not benefit from them, not use them. I go back to our own Declaration of Independence that you can read. And it says that so many times, this is a Jeff paraphrase, but so many times we won't step forward because the work of gaining your freedom sometimes seems too hard. And so we stay captive. You can actually live as a child of God in a manner that looks like captivity because you don't allow God to grant you and fulfill in and through you all of these freedoms that we've talked about, plus many, many more. And when you live that way, you will lose. And so will the many, many people that God desires to impact for the kingdom through your freedom. God desires that. So back to 2 Samuel, just to wrap up the Mephibosheth story. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 8 to 13. This is how it ended. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's son all that belonged to Saul and all of his house. You therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him and you shall bring in the harvest and your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Let me skip to verse 12. It said, and in verse 11, Ziba did all that the king said. Verse 12, Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And I was struck by that because the freedom that David was offering Mephibosheth would be used to grant freedom to Micah. And Mephibosheth could have said, I am not serving you, you dirty dog. I will not serve you. I will stay faithful to Saul. You might as well just kill me now because I'm not going to accept the freedom that you give me. And that's how the world sits so many times right now. I'm going to stay loyal to what I know. The world's waiting on us to show them what freedom in Jesus looks like. Because see, all those traits that I described to you, just imagine if one person took up all of those freedoms. No condemnation, love, forgiveness, service, all of that built up. Just imagine how appealing that person's witness becomes for the world to come to know Jesus. And then the freedom that you are given benefits the next generation. Mephibosheth said, thank you, David. I'm not worthy, but I will take it. And his son benefited. Mephibosheth understood the grace and the mercy of the king. He received back all his inheritance, had all his needs met, his family benefited, and he sat at the king's table forever. One final verse about our freedom. John 8, 36 says this. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. 
indeed. And you have a choice today. Are you going to be truly set free? One final thing as they're getting ready to play. I did a little research. Do you know that there are people who will make decisions Once they get out of jail, prison, they will make decisions that will cause them to be put back into prison. It appears as though there's a psychological and a physical and an emotional kind of dependency that's created when you get used to captivity that you can't function any longer in freedom. And sometimes in the church, that's how we are. Jesus has swung open the gate. Think Paul and Silas for just a second. Think Peter. Open the gate. And Paul and Silas said, wow, God just did something great. I ain't going. I'm going to sit right here. That makes no sense, does it? Church, let's make sense. Let's grab a hold of the freedoms that we have in Jesus. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to pray with one another. It's a time of decision, a time of commitment. However the Lord is challenging you through His Spirit, I pray that you will allow that to be how you respond to Him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and Lord, we do thank you for the country that you've allowed us to be in right now. Father, the freedoms that we experience, we understand, are greater than probably anybody in the world. And Father, the mercy and the grace that you've bestowed upon us to allow us to be in this country. Father, we are blessed by that. But Father, I pray that we would come to recognize in a greater a more complete way that our freedom, Father, is not based upon the country we call home, but that our real freedom is based upon who we call Savior. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the way your word spells out to us, Father, the freedoms that you desire for us to have. And I pray, Father, that you would allow us to be what I would consider the most blessed people in the world. We get to live in a country where we are free and we get to be free because of Jesus. May we, Father, rise up out of that and be used of you in every way you choose. Thank you, Father, for the freedom that we have in Jesus. And it's in his great, matchless, perfect, holy name we pray. Amen.
Father, you're a great and almighty God, and Lord, we love you. Lord, just thank you for a country in which we can have the right to freely worship you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for our independence as a country. But Lord, as a country, let us always remember that we should always be dependent on you. Lord, as Jeff has reminded us today that we are citizens of heaven, Lord. And with that, we have rights, Lord, when we just thank you for those rights from condemnation, from death, to come boldly for, before you, Lord. We just thank you that you're a Lord that wants us to be in your presence. Lord, we thank you for the freedom to forgive others and to overcome and start all over again and the freedom to love one another and the power to love people Lord and and to serve and to share Jesus with others and the freedom from distress and, and the freedom to ask for your wisdom Lord we need your wisdom and the freedom from sin Lord we've been reminded of those rights and freedoms today as citizens of heaven Lord but it's one thing to dwell in those freedoms but it's one thing to exercise those freedoms, to put them into practice. God, you are so faithful. Lord, we ask that you bless our tithes and offerings today. and May they bring glory to your kingdom. We say all of this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 